You're listening to the Greek's Gridiron, live with Ethan Haristadoulou. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Greek's Gridiron and another edition of This Week in the USFL, where we dive into all the news coming out of the USFL from the last seven days. We have a couple of reveals to talk about signings, players being put on the inactive list, and also the obvious as training camp has officially kicked off. So a lot to dive into, a lot to discuss. So my USFL fans, make sure you comment down below. Let me know how you're feeling about the Mahler's new uniforms. Are you excited? We are now just 22 days away from the start of season two of the USFL. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your opinions and how you're feeling about some of the signings as well. All of that and more, I want to hear from you all. So be sure to comment down below. But starting off with the big one, obviously, on Monday, the official start to training camp. The USFL is rocking and rolling. If you have not been on social media anywhere, I highly recommend dive into Twitter, dive into Instagram. You cannot scroll through anything USFL related without seeing some sort of training camp action going on right now. You're even able to tune in. If you live within the area, you can check out some of the training camp stuff that they're doing. This Sunday, they have youth camps as well. I believe it kicks off at 2 o'clock at every single stadium. So if you're somebody who lives in the area and you have a young one that's playing football or looking to maybe get a few more reps in during the springtime and into the summertime, they're offering some stuff there. So some really cool stuff going on as far as the USFL and training camp is concerned. But be sure to check it out. There is so much content flowing right now, and it feels... I don't really know how to explain it, but a little bit different. There is a buzz surrounding the USFL this year that was quite not there last year, obviously because I felt like we were going into a little bit more of the unknown with what was going to be happening with the reboot. There was also a little bit of a dark cloud hanging over the beginning of season one. If you don't remember last year being sued by a former owners of the league of the original USFL from the 80s. So there was a, lot, a very different feel, I feel like, going into last season, whereas this year it's just all excitement, hype is it's at all time high, I would say. And I'm very excited to see all this content being pushed out now. So make sure you check everything out. Training camp is underway. Players are in pads. They're in uniforms. And speaking of that, a big uniform reveal happened this week. We're still waiting on the showboats. The big reveal for the brand new team of the USFL, but the Maulers, who did a little bit of a reband, re, excuse me, rebrand, changing from purple and orange to black and gold, have now officially revealed what their new uniforms are going to look like. And I've got to say, I really like them. I liked the design in terms of like the way they structured the uniforms for the Maulers last year, but I was not a big fan of the purple and orange. It just it did not hit the eyes well, did not really like it, and it's Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh teams are black and gold. I really wanted to see them make the swap, and I was pumped to hear that they did. And I And if you're looking over on the screen right now, I'll have them up for you all. These uniforms look really nice, very sleek, and I've got to say, while the home uniforms look good, the away uniforms are where I'm really sitting there like, yes, that is it. I am very partial to the black shoulders with the white top and then like the yellow accents to it. I really like the Maulers away uniforms to the point where if they were running that for their home and away uniforms, kind of like what well, like the Dallas Cowboys do or something like that, I'd be all for it. I think that those white tops with the black shoulders is crisp. I'm all for it. Love the new uniforms. Maulers fans, how are you feeling about it? Because I would love to hear your thoughts. Going on off of that reveal, there was also another reveal as well during the midpoint this week. The 2023 logo for the USFL's kickoff weekend has been officially revealed as well. And I saw some conversation about this. A lot of people seem to like it. And one point that I noticed when I was scrolling through Twitter that I saw some people bring up, and this is something that I think really draws me into the USFL is... The USFL's just branding altogether has such a like classic and throwback feel to it. And this logo that they have here as well, it, it, it really, it, like, you know, it really like, like hammers away at that point, I guess you could say. I love the USFL branding and just the throwback. It, it, it reminds me of the NFL to an extent where they're feel, like even some of the newer redone logos that the NFL has still has like a classic feel that I, something it's like not something you get from the XFL. The XFL has very like sleek, slim and 
modern looking designs. And I'm not really a big fan of that look. And I'm not trying to like trash on the XFL or anything. This is just my personal opinion on their logo designing and everything. I'm not a big fan of that. And that goes for like any sort of sports league or anything like that. I like a more classic throwback type of look. I'm not a big fan of some of the newer logos we see from, and this is like sports in general. So the branding for the USFL, in my opinion, is top notch. And this logo is exactly what I could like envision in my own mind for what I'd want to see from them for kickoff weekend. Love it. Big fan. I want the USFL to keep rolling with this throwback look, whether it's new teams coming in in the future and how they continue to brand the league and, you know, continue on into season three, season four, season five. I hope they stick with this. I love the throwback feel, the the classic, not so modern look that the USFL carries. It just, despite the fact that the USFL is so new in terms of its return, it still feels like that, t- that league, even though they're not affiliated with it, that we saw back in those 80s. And then finally to dive into what is a laundry list of roster moves here and i'm going to highlight some of my favorite moves as well but first we'll just kind of rattle off everybody that has been either signed or moved into different positions on the team's rosters here starting off with the breakers signing a defensive lineman Keontae shad from oregon state big fan of this signing here i'll dive into it a little bit more he is one of the people i do want to highlight the gamblers made a couple of signings this week bringing in linebacker marcel spears jr he's from iowa state and interior defensive lineman damian daniels of nebraska those are two guys i also want to highlight as well cornerback tj carter from tcu and memphis he spent five years in the ncaa he was signed by the stallions this week we'll dive into him a little bit the Showboats went and signed themselves an offensive guard, Tyrone Prescott from NC State. Good way of beefing up the offensive line there for Memphis. The Stars making an interesting sh- signing, excuse me, with quarterback Vad Lee, the quarterback of the Maulers last season. He played a few games for them towards the back half of the year. And then they also made some moves. Linebacker Jordan Moore was moved to the suspended list, and apparently that does not necessarily mean that they were suspended due to discipline or anything like that, because I was reading some stuff where being moved to the suspended list could mean that you're potentially just not playing for the league this year and they're suspending your contract for the time being as in like your rights will still belong to that team should you decide to come back so i didn't find anything in terms of discipline on him and there's also another person that was moved as well to the suspended list so i wouldn't necessarily look at that as like a concerning type of thing the league hasn't really released any statements on it but that is something to just kind of keep an eye on and then the stars also went ahead and activated wide receiver kelvin Harmon from nc state and then for the panthers they went ahead and signed cornerback josh butler from michigan state 6'2, 182 pound corner and then they went and got themselves a d lineman as well in rondell carter from james madison those are all like the signings and internal roster moves there was also some stuff in terms of just taking people off of the active rosters here handful of guys moved to the inactives list from the philadelphia stars tight end bug howard Quarterback KJ Costello and offensive lineman Jahair Jones all moved to the inactive list here. When I was initially looking at the Vad Lee signing, I was kind of scratching my head, but the more I think about it and see this moving KJ Costello to the inactive roster, maybe there's something going on there where Costello is not going to be playing this year, and that ultimately prompted them to do the signing for quarterback Vad Lee. I don't really know, but it will be interesting to see what plays out. I'm assuming Case Cookus is the guy for the Stars. He looked awesome for them after Brian Scott went down last year, but just something to kind of keep an eye on is it he's just signed as the guy that's going to be their backup because they like what they saw from him last year. I don't really know, but a little bit of an intriguing signing and, you know, quarterback movement going on over there for Philadelphia. The Michigan Panthers transferring to the inactive list, defensive tackle Walter Palmore and cornerback Jalen Burrell. The Memphis Showboats went and moved guard Sedarius Hutcherson to the inactive list as well. And then the Houston Gamblers moved a couple of players, offensive tackle, I believe it's Bemadeli. Olaseni, I could be butchering that name. Apologies. And then defensive tackle Dion Noville. 
on top of that. So a handful of guys getting moved around from the rosters. Again, all these guys that are being moved to the inactives list, whether it's just they're not going to play this year, maybe it's an injury or something like that. I don't necessarily know the ins and outs. There hasn't really been any like official statements on what is up with these people being all put on the inactives list, but I would have to assume there's other opportunities potentially presenting themselves. You also have to keep in mind, this is springtime. NFL rosters are going through free agent signings right now. On top of that, these guys are potentially considered free agents by these NFL teams. Maybe some teams are in negotiations with them or these players feel like they don't want to tie themselves up with the USFL because they feel like maybe they have an opportunity to jump onto a practice squad or something, be like that 90th guy on a roster going into spring and into the summer training camps after the NFL draft. So while they are being moved to the inactive list, that's not to say that maybe they can't come back. Maybe they're just, you know, keeping their opportunities open and don't want to be putting themselves in the potential risk of hurting themselves. You know, you never know. It'll be interesting to see what happens with all these guys that are being moved to the inactive list, but a lot of movement going on as far as just player personnel throughout the entire league, I would say. Now, as for some of the people I want to highlight here, like I mentioned, there's a few guys on this list that I really like as signings. And I'm going to start with the gamblers because I'm actually a pretty big fan of both their signings, but linebacker Marcel Spears from Iowa State from his sophomore year to his senior year, Pretty good numbers, if I do say so myself. Playing at Iowa State, 36 games altogether, he totaled a whopping 268 tackles, 24 and a half tackles for loss, six sacks, four interceptions, two touchdowns, and 13 passes defense. This is a guy who is like a utility player. He can go off ball. You could have him play up closer to the line of scrimmage if you need to. He's six feet, 220 pounds. So, not necessarily the smallest nor the biggest, somewhere in between, but he does have some good size. This brings some really good depth and versatility to the linebacker room for the Gamblers, who already had a pretty impressive defense last year. I think this is an awesome signing for them. And then interior defensive lineman Damian Daniels from Nebraska as well. No slouch on his uh, in his own right. Big man up front, 6'3", 335 pounds. Big man up front. 43 games played for him. 78 total tackles. He had six and a half tackles for loss. Talk about adding depth and beefing up the interior of that defensive line. I really like this signing for the Gamblers as well. They're very clearly all in on their defense, but I think that is very much highlighted by linebacker Marcel Spears Jr. joining them. Big signing for Houston there. For the Breakers, they went ahead and signed defensive lineman Keontae Shad from Oregon State. He had a really good year in 2021. The guy's 6'2", 288 pounds, so not necessarily the biggest of like interior defensive linemen. This is a guy that you could essentially kind of fit in a few different places, I would say. But in 2021, through 12 games, he had 46 tackles, six tackles for loss, two and a half sacks, even had a fumble recovery as well. I really like this addition. The Breakers were not necessarily the most stellar team on defense last year towards like the back half of the year. They started out fairly strong and then things kind of tapered off. So I like this addition to the D-line. Be interested to see where he fits into the fold. But overall, good signing. For the Stallions, Cornerback TJ Carter, who played at TCU in Memphis. He has five years of experience in the NCAA. I believe this is somebody who took advantage of the extra year added on because it looks like his 2020 season was cut short because of COVID. So here we have a guy, five years of experience in the NCAA, a whopping 250 tackles as a corner. He's a tackler. He had 42 passes defensed, eight interceptions, three forced fumbles, and four fumble recoveries in his five seasons. This guy should be an impact player for a Stallions team that was already really good last year with a good amount of returning players this year. You add him into the secondary, this guy has playmaker written all over it. If he can find his role in this Stallions defense and catch on quickly, this is somebody that you really need to keep an eye on and someone who I really think could find himself within like the conversation of like defensive player of the year. He clearly has a nose for the ball. He's not afraid to tackle 250 tackles in five years. You're looking at 50 tackles a season from a cornerback. That's wild. And he's a good tackler at that 42 passes defense as well. That's what you're looking at. Like, I want to say what eight tackles for loss a season like these numbers are excuse me eight passes defense not tackles for loss eight passes defense per season like those are ridiculous numbers as well this is a bona fide playmaker that the stallions got on their defense so really like the signing by them hats off to them on this one here but 
those are just some of the guys that I really wanted to highlight, some of my favorite signings of this week. I would like to know if there's anyone else on this list that I mentioned that maybe you like that you're really excited about seeing on your favorite team. And if I missed any other roster moves, uh, I'm not going to sit here and act like the process that I have is the most perfect one in the world in terms of figuring out all of the roster signings. I have a list of all the teams for the USFL put together. I run through them uh, through social medias and try to collect all the information that I can find. And I bring it all to you all here. But if I miss a signing here or there, it would not be the first time I am far less than perfect. But if there's anyone that I missed that maybe you're excited about, feel free, fire away in the comment section down below. I'd love to hear about them and why you think that they're somebody that should be talked about some more. But that is everything as far as this week in the USFL goes. We're about 15 minutes into the video. So if you made it all to the way to the end, I appreciate you. And most importantly, I appreciate you. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time. Have a good one.